And what a promise. He will save you even now. And we're going to get a glimpse of that as we go through Joel. Now, when we last left off, the children of Israel had gone through a number of terrible times. The locust plague, a drought, scorching heat, the impending army that was going to come and take over their land, an army that was so powerful that it would climb the walls, they could play on the walls, run on the walls, meaning it would annihilate Israel's army and that the uh, tiny little kingdom of Judah would be ravaged. But at the end, before we left last week, Joel turned the corner and said, but wait, maybe God would relent. Maybe he'll leave behind a blessing. Maybe he will restore the grain, restore the wine, meaning that the children of Israel had an opportunity to, to think that maybe God would restore communion with them, that they would be able to bring an offering to God, that the worship time, that their personal relationship with God would be renewed, and that the nation as a whole would have the gift of God relenting from his judgment. The title of the message is, The Lord Rescues. I could have titled it, The Great Reversal. Because that's what we're going to see here. Instead of Judah being ravaged by a kingdom and an army from the north, there's a but there. And God begins to... To restore them, renew them, and rescue them. And he makes it clear, as we'll see, that it was he himself, the Lord, who brought this upon Judah. He brought the plague. He brought the drought. He even said that I sent. And this massive army that was coming was being brought by him to judge the people of Israel. But then he relented. And it's interesting to point out that when God wants to do renewal, he begins in his house. He begins with his people. He doesn't go out and, and threaten people who don't know him. He doesn't go out and say, you need to repent. When he wants something done, he goes to his people. And when there's correction that needs to be made, as a loving Lord, he corrects us and begins this renewal, this rescue, this, this reset in us as we reconnect with him. So let's go back to Joel 18, Joel chapter 2, verse 18. We left off 17 with this promise that God would spare his people. And that they wouldn't be a reproach anymore. When we get to verse 19. So at some point. They must have. They must have repented. Or. God in his great mercy. Decided not to bring the judgment coming from the army. Verse 18 says, Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered. So they must have said something. They must have repented. There must have been some crying out. Verse 19 says, The Lord answered and says to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil. And you will be satisfied. And I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. Just those two verses reveal the incredible grace and love of God and his desire to have communion with his people. Not just the communion that we're going to celebrate today, but an actual relationship with his people. The kingdom of Judah, about to be wiped out and annihilated, See, in this incredible reversal, 
where once they had nothing to offer God. They had nothing to represent worship, nothing to offer to him. But now God had pity on his people. He decided not to bring this disaster. This is good news. Imagine the rejoicing as Joel is sharing this with the nation of Judah and the children of Israel. Imagine the excitement and the relief that, yeah, the trees might be stripped bare from the locusts, and yes, the ground may be scorched by the heat, but praise the Lord, there is no army coming, and he's promising to give us something to give back to him. This outward sign of the inward work God is doing in us. Verse 20, I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched land. You see the reversal? Israel is going to get grain and wine and they're going to be able to have an offering again. But the army that was coming for them is going to be like they were. Driven into a drought-ravaged land. A parched and desolate land. And drive his vanguards into the eastern sea, and his rear guard into the western street, sea. And the stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. And the, and the great things there has done great and terrible things. This army that God was going to use to judge the nation of Israel has done great and terrible things in the past. And now God was going to punish them for what they had done. And instead of Israel being punished, God is using his grace to call them to himself. I'm not going to punish you. I'm going to offer you grace and mercy that you don't deserve. But because of his great love for his people, he's going to try grace instead of punishment. And even in punishment, there is an incredible love of God. But he said, I'm going to try something different. Verse 21, fear not, O land, and be glad and rejoice. For the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field. For the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine give their full yield. You can see the reversal unfold now. You can see how God has relented from his judgment and instead brought plenty. Instead brought salvation in an earthly sense, but offering salvation in a spiritual sense as well. God is the God of incredible reversals. And isn't that what he's done in our lives? That we were going down this path of sinful behavior, opposite from God, heading to hell, but, but because of Jesus, we've been given this great reversal. That our identity is no longer a child of wickedness. But it's a child who's been saved by the blood of Christ. Who's been given this opening to heaven. Snatched from the grip of hell because of what Jesus has done. We have been given this incredible reversal much like the kingdom of Judah has. And not just the people. But look at the land. And if you'll remember in Genesis what happened at the curse. It wasn't just Adam and Eve who were cursed. But it was the land who was cursed. And here in Joel, what did we see before? We saw the poor cattle wandering around, looking for water, looking for something to eat. They were probably delirious from dehydration and heat. And your heart breaks for God's animals to be seeking and not finding. And the ground was probably cracked. And, and you've seen it, if any of you have lived through a drought, even in your own backyards, when we go through months without rain, you see the, the ground, you see the earth open up. You see these deep cracks from lack of rain. But now, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice. For the Lord has done great things. Now, it's important that he says the Lord so that those who were worshiping or following 
false gods would know that this was by the hand of God. God gets all the credit here. Yahweh, Elohim, he gets the credit for the great reversal. Fear not, you beasts of the field. Why? For the pastures of the wilderness are green. They were barren, but now they're green. The tree bears its fruit, and the fig tree and the vine give their full yield. You're not going to go out and find a, a tree that's only bearing part of its fruit or that's shriveled up and, and not giving good fruit. But the grapevine and the trees, the fruit trees, are going to give their full fruit. This is an absolute 180 from where the children of Israel were just shortly before. Verse 23. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the early rain in your vindication. He has poured down for you the abundant rain. The early and the latter rain as before. Now get the picture. What happens in a downpour? We just, especially when it's hot, you get this great relief, this rush. The land drinks up the water. There's this overwhelming sense of refreshment. Now think of the children of Israel who were on the, at one minute scared because invaders were going to invade their very homes. And now God has brought this great gift of a bountiful, abundant land. And he gives us the illustration of his grace raining down. Where his mercy as a rain shower penetrates them. As water would penetrate the cracks in the ground and begins to heal and close up the cracks. So God is closing this gap between he and the children of Israel. He's restoring them. He's restoring their land. He's bringing back all the things that he'd taken away. Verse 24. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. These are pictures of blessing. Oil was important for worship, for soothing, for comforting, and it's also a sign of the Holy Spirit. And this passage reminds me of Psalm 23, when he speaks about, when David speaks about his cup running over. God is saying that your threshing floor will be full of grain, meaning that the harvest was incredible. Farmers know what it's like to have their silos or their bins full of grain. The land of Judah was empty and devoid of relationship with God. The land suffered. The cattle suffered. Now they are being restored in a complete manner. Not just spiritually, but physically as well. The land is healed. The grain is abundant. The grapes are abundant. God has taken them from the depth of despair and raised them up and revealed his glory, his grace, and his mercy that he is desperate to be connected with his people. Verse 25, I will restore to you the years that the swarming, swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. Now, he's speaking in this context of the army of locusts. He's not speaking of an earthly or a, a, a man-driven army. Now, when he speaks of northerner, which we saw earlier, that northerner he's talking about is a human army. And there's some debate that people think that this army that from the north is the locust. But if you look, in fact, I have some verses that if you want to check out for later that speak about the northerner. Isaiah 14, 31. Isaiah 41, 25. Zechariah 2, 6 and 7. And Jeremiah 1, 13 and 15. And there's many other, but this is just a good sample of 
the northerner being equated with a human army. All of Israel's enemies always came from the north. But God here takes credit for what the locust had done. He says, my great army, which I sent to you. But while God sent the army, what is he also doing now? He, like a thunderstorm, is pouring down on the children of Israel his unmerited favor and grace. Now they went from nothing. Listen to verse 26. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is no one else. And my people shall never again. He repeats himself. My people shall never again be in a, a reproach. Now listen, we've been hearing about the great and terrible day of the Lord. Joel's been, been reminding us of this great day, this, this terrible day that's coming, this, this judgment. But here is a different day of the Lord. This great day, this day of reversal, this day of rescue. We went from nothing to plenty and satisfied. Now sometimes we, in our current day, we kind of drift occasionally. We get off in this desert land where there's no water, there's no sustenance. Everything seems like it's taken away and we wonder, where is God? And the whole time he's saying, I'm right here. I have this great reversal for you. Come back to me. He reveals himself as the great Savior. He is the one and only true and living God. There is none else beside him. And the Lord makes it clear. He was in control of the destruction. He is making it clear that he is sovereign over all of Israel. And in fact, over all his creation, <clears throat> he takes credit for judgment and he takes credit for this incredible reversal and this beautiful rescue. Imagine, if you will, if you've gone days or weeks without food or water. And for us, it, it's hard to imagine the whole time wondering where my salvation is. Where is the horn of my salvation? Where does my sustenance come from? There's only judgment in my life. And then God relents and says, instead of judgment, I'm going to bring you grace and mercy. And that's what he does for each and every one of us. And there's a reason why we use Joel during Lent some of the readings in Ash Wednesday. Because God makes it clear that this book applies to a certain context in a certain time, but it also applies to our life today. Just as the children of Israel went sideways and God graciously, lovingly brings them back into communion. What a gift that we get to talk about communion again on the day in which we will celebrate the Lord's table. We will get to celebrate this outward sign of the incredible work that Christ has done and the work that he's done in each and every one of us. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. He's loving. He's dwelling with us. And that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else, and my people shall never again be put to shame. Let's pray as we head into communion.
Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of Joel's letter. Thank you for recounting your grace and your mercy. Thank you that even in our personal lives, when we deserve your correction and judgment, sometimes instead of what we deserve, you give us what we don't deserve. And we're grateful for when we deserve judgment, you bring grace and you bring mercy. And we thank you for the judgment Jesus bore on our behalf, that you rescued us but you called our name and we heard. So today, this morning, as we revel and in and contemplate the horror that you suffered on our behalf, the great cost of our forgiveness, and the great joy at your resurrection, that we are a people who have hope. We've been restored. You've been made new. Father, keep that in mind as we celebrate the gift that Jesus gave us. And that is this outward sign that we can participate in. In his body, in his blood. We pray it all, Father, in Jesus' name.